Just as Los Angeles police thought they were gaining ground in the war against gangs, the street violence claimed another life. Look out your window, let's take a trip to the ghetto, the ghetto. Appreciate you uh, joining the program and sharing your, uh, your story about your life as a police officer. You, you graduated the academy in 1985, correct? That's correct. Okay, cool. 1985. This is about the time I really wanted to talk with you about specifically the 80s and the, the 90s because L.A. was a war zone. It was on fire, especially when it comes to gang activity and, you know, drugs. Crack cocaine was, was huge. Um, now, 1985, what area or precinct did you cover your rookie year? Well, uh, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I graduated, went to the academy in Orange County uh, in Huntington Beach at the Orange County Criminal Justice Training Center, uh, Class 79. And uh, went to work, and the, the first guys that offered me a job was the uh, L.A. City Housing Authority Police Department. And I was so anxious to become a cop that, you know, I took that job. And uh, I was also processing, you know, in Santa Barbara. Had I waited, uh, you know, maybe three weeks or more, you know, I might have done my time up there instead of in, in the city. But um, I, I took that job, and I ended up working in, in the housing projects in the city of Los Angeles. Okay. And, uh, South Los Angeles was, uh, you know, I, I always remember that Kumo D song. You know, it was the Wild Wild, Wild West. West. Yeah, yeah. It was it was the Wild Wild West when I was out there, yeah. and um, it was, uh, you know, it was it was culture shock uh, for a kid from the valley, and uh, it was uh, it was awakening. It was an awakening for me um, to see uh, how people lived in South Los Angeles and. Uh, you know, the kind of uh, issues that the people who actually live there are facing. Mm, yeah. So for anyone who doesn't know, he's talking about the housing projects. You know, I can name them, Nickerson Gardens, Imperial Courts, Jordan Downs. Am I along the lines of uh, the area that you were working in? Oh, that, that's it. You okay. know, down in Harper Division, also down in Dana Strand and Rancho San Pedro down there. Oh, okay. Um, out in Pacoima. Oh, so you saw uh, all the projects. Garden. Damn. Uh, all the projects, there were 21 housing projects in the city of Los Angeles, and uh, I worked uh, ah, patrol, okay. uh, plainclothes narcotics, gang enforcement, and all all over the city. Oh, that must have been interesting. So you were plainclothes narcotic, was a uh, narcotic officer, was that uh, targeted to, towards crack cocaine mostly, or was it just obviously anything, but was crack cocaine your biggest job? Let, let me tell you something. I bought dope, I bought weed, I bought crack, I bought PCP. I bought it all mm. as, as an undercover cop, and uh, you know we did we did control buys, we did street buys, we worked with informants, we served search warrants. Um, everybody at that department, because of the uh, jurisdiction where we worked, everybody became a uh, expert on gangs and narcotics. Mm. Okay. What are some of the, I'm sure there's a lot of downtime, you know, people think cop work is all fun and just exciting all the time, like Bad Boys 2 or something, but, um, you know, what, what are some of the day-to-day -day duties of an undercover plainclothes narcotics officer? You know, uh, working narcotics is, uh, uh, it was a fun assignment. Um, you spend your day developing sources. So, you know, we all know, uh, you know, uh, street locations for uh, street sales of narcotics. Everybody knows where there's that. You know, back in those days, you don't see it so much now, but back in those days, people would stand on the corner. Guys would mm -hmm. stand on corners, you know, and they would post up, and yeah. you had runners, and you had lookouts, and you had the dope in one spot, and uh, uh, the guy who took the money at the other spot. And so it took a lot of surveillance, uh, a lot of um, watching people, uh, gathering information, getting information from the patrol guys about what they're seeing, and then uh, going out and trying to fit into the community and, and buying dope. You know, we would buy dope and have an arrest team. We would go in, to get, you know, one or two of us would walk in, uh, make a purchase, walk out. Uh, you know, the signal that we made a good buy was a cigarette. I'm going to take a cigarette out of my ear and light it up and uh -huh. start to walk out, and the arrest team would come in. And, uh, you know, that was doing street enforcement. We did, uh, you know, reverse buys where we took off the dealers and then sometimes we reversed it up and sold fake rock to uh, buyers. And, um, you know, it's just very dangerous stuff. And, uh, you know, one of the things that struck me about those times was just the amount of cash that was on the street. Yes. There was so much money out there. And, you know, when you run into 14-year-old kids and 12-year-old kids 
uh, on mopeds, uh, little scooters back, not the kind you see today, yeah, but mopeds, yeah. little, yeah. Um, you know, with four grand in their pocket, 10 grand, <laughs> you know, you more you money than you have in your, have yeah. <laughs> but, um, it, 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 it takes long hours, you know, you have to be very patient and, you know, contrary to what people think about law enforcement, uh, before you can actually make an arrest, you have to have probable cause and you have to have evidence and you have to make your case. And, you know, for cops working on the street, whether it's narcotics or working patrol, uh, whatever your assignment is, th- there's two things that you live by. One is what does the law say? And then number two is what does department policy say? Okay. So when I see what I believe is a crime, I have to act as I'm watching it unfold in front of me. I can only respond to what's happening right in front of me. And the whole time in my head, I have to go, okay, is this legal? And is this within department policy? Those are the two things we always have to do. That's why the majority of, of cases, uh, you know, that cops bring to, uh, to the DA's office for filing, uh, most people just pled out. They didn't even take it to trial because, uh, you know, we had a solid case and they faced more time if they went to trial and lost. She said she want to see the city bus She don't want to ride the city bus Because she's new to the town I advise, look for truth The ears are lost in the sound Brains are lost in the cloud Dead from all of the smoke That's the reason why the ostrich hides his head in the ground That's the reason why the monster even puts on a mask And we turn the city green to blend in with the grass The city scene made a crash I fell in love with it twice Had to tell her goodbye cause she fell in love with the night I couldn't keep up, I tried to bring it down from the sky But the clouds were so nice that she took a nap for a while And when she woke up I finally had a kid And the lady bone told me saw the other day with the baby ain't life crazy i think about it once in a while when it's cloudy outside and the sun goes none of these drugs do what they supposed to yeah and what's the point of hurting people that you're close to yeah most of my life i've been following stars knowing i ain't really had to go that far come to find out is the truth i already know yeah Spinning out a cylinder, moving, I'm in reverse Committing crimes of passion, judging jury at first But I love that girl, been my woman since day one Had a couple of kids in the house, the job done So what happened while we ain't loving no more? Maybe I should take some blame instead of taking the score But me and more don't go, I'm begging you gotta change Just as Los Angeles police thought they were gaining ground in the war against gangs, the street violence claimed another life. Look out your window, let's take a trip to the ghetto, the ghetto. I want to talk a little bit more about the undercover piece. Because you know, okay. you're, you're due from the valley. You, you you come to this new area. You know that you like you said it was a culture shock. You know how do you does do you, does one have to take acting lessons? Do they bring people to the precinct <laughs> to teach you how to look like a crackhead? Like talk to me because me personally, look when I was doing my dirt way back in the day, 25 years ago or whatever, I I. I I knew the people who didn't belong. You know what I mean? You know when you see somebody, oh, that's a tourist for sure. Or nah, that right. right there is an undercover. Nah, uh, uh. Like, how do you, you know, how, how do you get past that? And, and like I said, do you guys do any acting classes, or what, what's the deal with that? I, I never did any acting classes. Uh, that's funny. Uh, I, I just, you know, I have. Uh, <laughs> th- there's a look. There's a look that cops get, and, and there's a, a look that criminals have. You know, and it's, it's different from the general population. Like, even to this day, you know, just the look on my face, there have been times You're a cop. I'll be out in public and, and a person that I know is a parolee looks at me and I can see in his eyes goes, I know that guy's a cop. Even you carry though yourself I'm like an officer, period, yeah. We just always have that look and, and you just acknowledge each other, you know, you just look at each other like, hey, okay, all right, I, yeah, I get it. You know, game, recognize game. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but you just, you know, you just slip into it. You work, I worked with some really good street cops 
and uh, watching them operate, you know, learning how to be an operator, learning how to speak the lingo, learning how to relax. You know, the biggest part of working undercover is just relaxing, you know, learning not to fucking panic, just being cool and, and doing your thing. The, the crooks don't panic when they're selling dope. So you can't panic when you're buying it. <laughs> you know, you can't look scared. You can't look edgy. Uh, you know, well, I mean, one of the first times I tried to buy crack down in Harbor Division, uh, we drove up in this car from rent wreck and, you know, me and my partner drive in, I, I'm in the passenger seat and, um, the dude walks up to the car and he goes, uh, into my side and he goes, uh, Hey, what are you looking for? And I go, Hey man, uh, let me get a quarter. And he looked at me and it just didn't come out right. You know, it didn't come out mm. natural. And so he reached his hand in his pocket and he pulled out a 25 cent quarter. Nah. And he goes, <laughs> and he goes, this is what you're looking for now. Yeah. <laughs> and then he, he, you know, he you off guard. The car. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> he threw it in the car and walked away. That's <laughs> hilarious. Actually. That's funny. Hurt my feelings, man. That's too funny. <laughs> but you, yeah, you, you just slide into it. You know, after, after what you have to watch people do it and then you have to go with them while they do it. And then you just do it yourself and then you teach people how to do it. Okay. You know, this is something I've always wanted to ask because training day is one of my favorite Denzel movies uh, of all time. And I don't know if this is true. And um, I don't want to ask you if you personally did it, but you know, let's just say a uh, 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 dude who you're trying to uh, buy crack from, he says, hit this shit in front of me just so I know you're not a cop. Do, are cops allowed to do that? Like what's the protocol behind that? Well, there is no protocol. You know, the protocol is stay alive. Wow. And okay. so, so you, uh, you know, each individual officer has to decide in that moment how he's going to play it. Mm. Sometimes, uh, you know, they'll, they'll uh, try to do a distraction technique, you know, you know, raise hell. Try, yeah. Hey, well, you know, we talking about you? You try to do, distract them that way. Mm. Uh, I heard of uh, DEA guys uh, being forced into that position and sticking the needle into their skin, but then making sure the needle came out the other side of the skin, oh, uh, you know, so it wasn't visible and pushing it. But, you know, so it looks like you're shooting up, but you're not. Um, you know, I was fortunate that that kind of stuff is when you do deep cover, when you go undercover and you have a handler and you don't, you know, I work narcotics where we did by bus, but it was always with a team. I never had to work by myself and infiltrate a gang and, and try to be, you know, be like, a, hey, I'm a street guy, whatever, uh, or I'm from out of town and I'm looking to make a major buy. I didn't, I didn't do major narcotics like that. We, we did street enforcement mm -hmm. of narcotics that were, you know, being sold on the street and in the projects. Okay, which is, I'm sure, a, I'm just guessing a bigger job than the guys who are going after the Pablo Escobars of the world. I mean, oh, I mean it, it was a never ending job. Yeah. You know, uh, those were the days of freeway, uh, Rick Ricky Ross. Ross. Yeah. And, and there, was, there, there was just crack everywhere. There yeah. was crack everywhere. There was money everywhere and there was guns everywhere. And, um, it, it was, it, you know, it just, it, it just, it, I re I realized after a few years, I realized that what we were doing is futile. And, and I, and, and now I think, you know, in 2021, I can honestly tell you that we waged a war on drugs and drugs won. Yeah. I've heard that many times and it's I've not yeah. heard it. It's pretty obvious, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, okay. Damn. That was a good start. I like, I like stories like that. Um, I want to jump into your time and forgive me if I'm saying this wrong as a gang task force officer. What, what's the proper, uh, well, I, I was a, uh, Gang enforcement gang. guy. There you go. Gang enforcement. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. But we, we, we started as at our department, we didn't have a gang unit. So I started it and, um, we started as a gang intelligence unit cause it was just me and a partner. Okay. So we thought the way, the way to do this was gather intelligence on, uh, on the narcotics act activity in the project and then, you know, start to build cases and use the crime impact team to serve warrants. Hmm. So that's how I began. And, uh, so I had to go to the, you know, I went to the sheriff's gang school. I went to the LAPD gang school, uh, rode with OSS from the sheriff's department. I rode with crash and uh, DSD gangs out of LAPD. And so you get to know these guys. And, and, and again, you know, it's learning how to operate, man. It's learning how to speak the lingo, how to get the look, how to recognize who's who in the zoo, uh, you know, recognizing how to read the, the gang graffiti, knowing what it means. Uh, you can tell what beefs are going on by what's on, on the wall. Yeah. And so, 
uh, you know, it's just a process of learning how to do it from those guys who are already doing it and already uh, experts in it. And, um, but, you know, it, it was uh, it was very dangerous, but it was also a whole lot of fun. You know, it, it was really a lot of fun to just be out there uh, in the middle of, uh, you know, when, you, when you're it's like being on a movie set, man. It, it's yeah. just, uh, you know, there are times I'll look around like there's one time where there's a, a running gun battle in one of the housing projects in Hollenbeck Division on the east side of the city. And me and my partner were there and we could hear, you know, we could hear the guy and the echo was, the sounds were echoing off the buildings. Me and my partner were on foot and we could hear them running and shooting at each other, gang members and a cop. And, uh, you know, and I remember taking a knee and all of a sudden the air unit, uh, you know, banks in at an angle and it's just, it looks like boom, the fucking the, the, bad boys three scene or something, man, the, the, the lights come on. And, and I remember I'm standing there on my knee at the corner of a building and I have my Beretta in my hand and I'm looking around the corner, waiting for a homeboy to run in my direction. And, and in that moment I had this thought, I, I thought, man, there is no place on this earth that I would rather be in this moment than right here and right now. Just as Los Angeles police thought they were gaining ground in the war against gangs, the street violence claimed another life. Look out your window, let's take a trip to the ghetto. The ghetto. I want to talk about the gang unit, uh, the gang enforcement um, unit, because, you know, 85, it, well, let me ask you, when did you actually join that particular a unit or start that unit. I said, I should say. Uh, that was about, uh, yeah, I was learning the craft of police work for, uh, I was in the Academy in 84, graduated in 85, 86, 87. I became a training officer. And then, you know, uh, I probably had three or four years on the job when, uh, I went to the gang school okay. and started working gangs. 89, 90 ish. Okay. Where Correct. gangs were, it was out of control. If you think LA is, bad now and our numbers are unfortunately skyrocketing right now when it comes to violent crime and homicide it was nothing nothing like it was back in the 90 91 92 93 where we in 93 i think we had upwards of 2,000 homicide 2,000 plus homicides in so one number year crazy yeah, yeah and and to, to give you guys a um a um a comparison i think last year in la we had something like 400 or something like something along those four or five hundred something along those lines um so you right, but we're, we're creeping back up now we are and, yeah and uh you know it, we haven't reached the level it was back then but as i'm watching things unfold i, I just shake my head because like oh, man we're, we're headed in the wrong direction we're headed back to the 80s that really sucks, man. Yeah, I want to talk about that to end the show, um, but I want to build up to it and discuss, you know, your, your time on the gang enforcement um, team. Now, let's see, 1989, 1990. Um, what, what are some of the things you had to learn? You know, you said you, you, you went to classes, you know, you, you, to, to spot things like graffiti. What are some of the things one has to learn to be a gang enforcement officer? Well, the, the most important part is learning how to recognize uh, you know, knowing the gang areas, like who's claiming what area. So, you know, where you're at. And, and, and then once you get out there, you know, you have to learn to approach it differently. So sometimes I'd go into a gang area and just come out hardcore. You know, if you see guys, you start chasing them or you, you know, rush them with the car and, and get everybody on their knee. Back then we should put them on their knees. Like you see on colors, you know, the movie, yeah. um, but, uh, and then other times you just get out of the car, put your hands in your pockets and go, Hey man, what's going on? What's happening fellas? You know, <laughs> why are you all out here? <laughs> what's going on? And, you know, and, and you establish relationships. And, uh, you know, I remember one time, uh, there was a, I went to Hollenbeck station and there was a, an LAPD company had a, uh, a quick gang member in custody and he was trying to take his photo with a, a Polaroid camera in the station to put him into the gang folder. That was before we had databases and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and, but it was a dude that I knew, and it, was a, and it was a guy. We had a mutual respect for each other. So the officer is about to tighten him up, and I come walking in the back door, and, and I see the thing. And so I see the dude, and I go, hey, man, why are you giving me so much of a hard time? He's just trying to take your photo. You know the game? And, and he looked at me, man, this dude, he, you know, he did this, he did Okay, all right. I told the officer, hey, man, let me talk to him for a minute. He goes, okay. So, you know, I, I took the guy aside and I go, hey, uh, this guy just trying to do his job, man. There's, there's no reason to cause all this thing. They're going to start using force and it's going to get us, but there's no need for all that. Do me a favor. Let the dude take your picture. 
And he looked at me and he looked at the other officer and oh man, all right, man. And he sat down and the dude took his photo and that was that. But so that could have ended up in a use of force uh-huh. inside the police station. <laughs> uh, but because I had a relationship and numerous contacts with this guy, uh, the guy knew that if I caught him dirty, I would take him to jail. But he also knew that I was fair and I didn't mess with people just to mess with them. Nice. It, it, when I came around, I tried to be fair, uh, but firm. And, you know, I'm not going to break the law, but I'm also not going to mess with you. I'm not going to, if you're not committing a crime when I get there, uh, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not going to uh, try to put hooks on everybody every time I see them. Sometimes I'm just trying to get information. Sometimes I'm just saying, hey, what's going on? Go, you know, uh, y'all can't be hanging out right here. Or, hey, man, I, I got a, I got a complaint about y'all, so y'all need to move it on or something. You, you know, get to push in. Otherwise, I have to come back and we have a different conversation. All right, man. All right, man. You know, and then there's other times you drive by and somebody throws a beer bottle at your car and, you know, you put it in reverse and you jam them with the car. I jumped out with a shotgun, racked around and said, okay, who threw that bottle? And, you know, when you rack a shotgun around into the gauge, uh, people stop and people listen. You know, on the street, it's I'm punking you out. Mm. You know, uh, if somebody throws a beer bottle at your car and it breaks on the car, on the trunk or just behind the vehicle and you punch it and drive out of there, uh, you know, they, everybody's going to laugh. Yeah, mm-hmm. we ran those, we ran them, them off. Pac-Man. Yeah. And we, uh, <laughs> uh, the guys that I work with, uh, we didn't run. <laughs> mm. And there were times when it was just two of us, but you know, the shotgun is a, a great equalizer. <laughs> and when you pull that out and you have that look and you rack around into the chamber, uh, people, people know you're serious. That's why I have two in my house right now. Yeah. Yes, sir. Legal, legal, Look, guys. That was, that legal. was my favorite weapon. I say it was my favorite weapon. That's I'd it, something about that sound, right? That's right. Yeah. I'll jump off the car in a hot minute with the gauge <laughs> rack around and see what's up. I'm at a crossroads every damn day, looking back in my past when I sleep. But living on the edge, not doing enough. Iniquity down to my feet. What do I do when I need a little food and I gotta get the money for the rent? Fall to my knees, pray to the Lord, come on, son, he can give me some money, repent. What? What? Thank you. I really love you, baby, so I spank you. Life is a west straight, fucking you up. Living in a prison, I'ma shank you. So what's love got to do with it? When it with my heart on my sleeve, I'm a foe. But she said she loved me, she wanted to hug me, under my sheets, so it's get told. I spy with my little mind's eye, dreams that are beyond what you can see in daylight, baby. Ignore the rain, and everything gon' be okay. And while the world burns, I'll be near the skyline, and I'll be biding my time till I can ride the wave. And everything gon' be okay Yeah What are the chances? You're picking a flight, we're leaving tonight Pack up your bags, we're leaving this place and this baggage Cause what could we do? While Rome is collapsing But not in a day, we'll be okay Let's hit the Amalfia Jackson to pull up the map then Cause I'm through keeping up with these Joneses Don't care what they're posting You know, you only see what they show you Let's fall off the grid then Cause we don't owe nothing to no one Darling, just listen, it'll be Just like starting over I spy with my little mind's eye Dreams that'll be on What you can see in daylight, baby Ignore the rain Everything gon' be okay And while the world burns I'll be near the skyline And I'll be biding my time Till I can ride the wave Then everything gon' be okay Just as Los Angeles police thought they were gaining ground in the war against gangs, the street violence claimed another life. Look out your window Let's take a trip to the ghetto, the ghetto. Three years into your, your, um, your profession, a little movie called Colors comes out. Uh-huh. Did, did you see Colors uh, when it first came out <laughs> is my first question. Um, secondly, how real was it to you being that you were living that life? And then uh, thirdly, tell me about 
I heard about all the violence that my mom and dad, stepdad did not let me go see it because obviously people were getting shot at theaters and things like that. So talk to me right. about that whole general time right there, uh, the 1988 and the movie Colors. Well, uh, I did see the movie at the time and, um, you know, it was a little cheesy. Uh, I think, uh, the, um, the Sean, Par- uh, Sean, what's his name? Uh, Sean Penn. Yeah. His partner, uh, oh, yeah, Danny, Dan, uh, Duvall, something, Robert Duvall. Robert Duvall, right. That's the kind of guys that I knew. Mm. I knew guys like him. Okay. And, you know, those were, those are, you know, you had, you had your hotheads like Sean Penn tried to be, uh, but, um, most of the guys I worked with weren't like that. You know, the, the, we were, we were trying, we, we really thought we were doing the Lord's work quite as a tip. You know, we were, we, but we were trying to do the right thing and do it the right way, arrest the right people for the right crimes, uh, and stay alive. And, and you don't do that by being a hothead and being an Adam Henry with people out there in, in you know, in the community where you don't live. So you got to show a little bit of respect and, um, you know, and, and so if you can balance that in your head, uh, you know, you, you can develop, uh, a, a, again, I go back to the relationship word, mm-hmm. you, you know, you, you have to develop relationships with the people, uh, in the area that, that you're working, you know, if you're working patrol, if you're working gangs, you're working, uh, you know, narcotics, not so much, but if you're working gangs, you're working patrol, you're working detectives, you know, as you're out there moving around. Uh, you, you have to be nice to people. You have to talk to them and, and listen to them and see what's going on. So I saw it and I thought it, I, I thought it was a little bit cheesy. I, I liked uh, Robert Duvall's character because I, I kind of more identified with, with him and the way he was trying to work out there because that's the way the real gang work is done. Uh, but if you talk about uh, realistic movies, you know, Denzel was fun mm-hmm. to watch, but you couldn't get away with that. You know, uh, the, the Rampart scandal uh, was similar to what they were doing and, that was, you know, that's an anomaly that, you know, that's not how police work was done. I, I never saw guys do any of that kind of, you nobody know, killed anybody or set people up like that. Um, the, the movie though, if you're talking about movies, the, the one that's the most realistic to me is End of Watch. Is, you know, what End, is of, it called? End of Watch. End of Watch. Oh, I don't think I've ever seen it. Yeah, it was Michael Pena and, um, gosh, what's that white boy's name? Uh, it'll come to me in a second. I'll look it up. Go ahead. But, but that movie is the is the first movie that I ever saw where they actually captured the relationship between the two cops working uh, in a in a police car. Jake Gyllenhaal in, out, out in the city. Jake and, Gyllenhaal. Uh, yes, yes, Jake Gyllenhaal. Those two guys, their their characters were uh, you know the, the most real that I've seen. But really, it was the relationship between those two guys that they were. Uh, you know the 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 closeness and the friendship and the bond that that occurs uh, with your partner when you spend a lot of time with the same guy, and uh, and you get in and out of scrapes together. You know when when you go out there, you're really saying, "Hey, man, I'm putting my life in your hands, and you can put yours in mine. You can trust me, and I'm gonna take care of you." So if you go if you go down, I'm going down with you. Uh, you know you're not going down by yourself. I'm not going to punk out. I'm not going to run away and leave you hanging. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be there. And, uh, and that, that, that kind of trust is rare. And, you know, you know, it, it's rare in life to meet guys like that. But, um, yeah, that, that's the movie that, that I think is, uh, the most realistic colors is fun to watch, but you know, that whole, that, you know, the, the gang issue it has moved beyond red versus blue now. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and when, when that first came out, it, it was about that. It was about, uh, Crips and Bloods really. Uh, but it evolved or devolved, if you will, into the narcotics trade. You know, when, when I first, uh, when I was a police explorer in high school, um, you know, there were criminals and there was guys who did robberies. There was guys who did burglaries. There were guys who were thieves. There were guys who were shoplifters. There were guys who were hype. There were guys who were dope dealers. They all, they all had their own crime, but as, as time has evolved and the drug, and, and we lost the drug war, and as we lost the drug war, all crime, all the crime in Los Angeles now that you see on a daily basis, all the shootings, all the homicides, all of it is gang related for narcotic sales. Mm-hmm. It's all the narcotic trade. The, uh, the, the Mexican cartels have infiltrated uh, America 
Southern California, Los Angeles County, and they've been here for years and they operate freely. That open border down there uh, to see what's happening at the border is just unconscionable because oh daily God. there is money, drugs, dope, and guns moving back it's and forth across that like border. Nothing, and anybody who denies that who who denies that just does not know what the hell's going on down there. Yeah, yeah, and we're we're we live in Los Angeles. We're a couple hundred miles from the border, so we're directly affected. You may not feel it in Iowa, you know, you may not feel it even in Washington. You're, you know, but we're feeling it. Oh no, they, they feel they feel it out there because yeah. you know the the routes. If you see the routes as they come in, it go they go throughout the country. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they, they, they're moving dope everywhere throughout the country using that border, and to open it back up is just the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. Yeah, no, 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 come on. It's just you and me. School is in session, baby, but I don't play. I know you wanted to go to recess, but I take that away. Understand I'm the man, even if you had a plan. If you make 200,000, I'm keeping 100 grand. Wait a minute. Because I'm pimping you, bitch. This is America, so why not get rich? When you're searching for your music, you're playing my station. I'm two steps beyond, maybe that's the fascination. One plus one equals two. I'm talking you and me. You talking me and you. When we come together, we be feeling absolute we put one in the air and be feeling so cool ooh, ooh. i'm a west coast rapper from the city of the hub everywhere i go i get that california love like i'm the plug they trying to tap into my energy when i hit the spot you know i'm coming with that synergy replenishing like gatorade got they levels up and now we two steps beyond these lames kicking up dust never running from the smoke we really want the smoke only from clone god though let's go one plus one equals two I'm I'm talking you and me, you talking me and you. When we come together, we be feeling absolute. We put one in the air and be feeling so cool. My inner sugar ooh, ooh. Fruit. I'm a Gemini, bitch, so you know what that means. It means that sometime one plus one equals three. I'm a wandering star with two grams up in my cigar and a heart with two scars. So pardon if I snap, girl, I'm sorry. Bitch, pass me the lighter. I'm about to play Street Fighter. Hot dude in that pussy, like my name, Ken Ryu. She says she never kissed a girl. Well, bitch, tonight you experiment. Put this tablet on your tongue and just enjoy the experience. Just as Los Angeles police thought they were gaining ground in the war against gangs, the street violence claimed another life. Look out your window, let's take a trip to the ghetto, the ghetto. Fast forward a few years, a very significant uh, big event in our uh, lifetime. I was about 12, I was 12 years old, 14 years old, actually, um, talking about the, the riots in 1992, 93, I remember, brother. 92 uh -huh. riots. Take right. me back to that time, being a police officer. I mean, you're enemy number one, you know, let's keep it real. Um, and, and what, what, what was your, uh, your time like around that period? Well, you know, I was, um, I had taken some time off to, uh, to assess, you know, how, how much longer I wanted to do this. I, I'd taken like three You've months off. shit, right, basically. You're like, dude, I need <laughs> and, and, a break. And so, so you know, when, when that happened, I basically watched it on TV, oh, and, wow. and, I, and I wondered, you know, should I just go back in or, you know, but technically I'm off. And, uh, but I, I opted to stay out of it. And, you know, the guys that, uh, that I know that, that were there out there during, during that time, uh, you know, it was very much like uh, the Watts riots of 65. It was, uh, you know, it was destruction of property and fires and looting. And um, it was very different than the George Floyd riots we saw all of last year. Um, you know, I, I thought there might be riots after the George Floyd incident. Um, but there, this, you know, it, it, the George Floyd riots took a whole different tack. The criminals, instead of destroying their own communities, decided to go to the upscale communities and go loot and riot over there. Right. And that was a whole different tactic. And I think it caught law enforcement um, Smart, huh? asleep, asleep at the wheel. I don't think they expected that. And they didn't want to overreact to what was happening. So they let it go on. And, you know, when they let it go on, the criminals read that as, oh, they're not going to make any moves on us. So, you know, I know I know that people were driving in from all the surrounding counties uh, trying to get to L.A. County, trying to get to West L.A., trying to get to Santa Monica and to Long Beach 
to uh, get in on this stuff because uh, it was it was open season on the small businesses down there, and um, so you know the 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 Korean community is really uh, interesting to note because during that time they realized that LAPD and the police department had nothing for them. They weren't going to protect them or their so businesses. Much. So they armed themselves, mm -hmm. and uh, and they commit they took care of their their own community. Love that. And and, and they also you know they exchanged rounds with guys. I guys know. shot at them and they fired back. There's famous footage online. I, you, I'm sure you've seen it a thousand times yourself. That's right. And uh, you know that that's unfortunately uh, when if this stuff hits the fan, people don't realize that there's not going to be a nine one one. There is nobody to call. The lines are going to be down, uh, and even if you can get through, they have nobody to send you. Uh, there's not going to be any uh, EMTs to send to you. You have to have the training and the equipment right on you, right where you are, wherever you are, whether you're at work, in your vehicle, or at your house. You have to have everything you need to protect yourself and to take care of any kind of injuries. And whether it's a riot or a major earthquake, you're still going to be on your own. And, and I think people aren't really prepared for that. They, they just don't believe well, it'll ever happen to them. And we live in the, 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 the city of earthquakes, and I bet 90% of people don't even have a kit. They don't know how to tie a tourniquet. Like, there's, you're right. You're 100% right. And, if, you, you know, if, if you were to jump in the car with Gil, so, you know, Gil has his gear right on him uh, in my car. I have a medic bag in my car. I have one that I carry on my person. I can, you know, I can stop the bleeding. Uh, I could protect us if I had to. Uh, I have one in my house, have one in my car, and have one in my person. So everywhere I go, I have all the things that I would need, uh, even if I happen to be somewhere where I don't have a gun. Like if you look at the Route 91 shooting in Vegas, mm -hmm. uh, you know those people were in a concert. So they, even the even the cops that I knew that were there weren't armed, wow. but because they have level heads, they they understood that when you when you when there's gunshots, you take cover. Mm -hmm. That that means get behind something that can stop a bullet. Mm -hmm. They take cover and they know it has to go in cycles. So when the shooting stops, he's reloading. That's the time to move. Mm -hmm. So that's why the cops that I knew that were there, they didn't get shot. They didn't get hurt wow. and uh, they didn't even get traumatized. They just got out of there <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> with the people that, you know, uh, that they were with. Um, and so, so, you know, uh, we should be uh, prepared for all of that. There was one other thing that I wanted to ask you about because uh, you were you were an officer at that time as well. And this was big in the gang world. Um, I'm talking about the, the Watts gang truce that followed shortly after, you know, the uprise in Los Angeles. What do you remember about that time? You know, I remember thinking that um, these, quote, truces, close quote, were just a joke. You know, I remember thinking that okay. and, and I'm happy to say that I was actually wrong about that. You know, there, there, there came a time when even the gang members said, you know, there's too many uh, civilians getting caught in the crossfire. You know, when you have children being uh, shot, when you have civilian, I mean, I, I remember responding to uh, a scene of a drive-by shooting where they missed the guy they were shooting at but an eight month pregnant oh. female was laying on the oh, ground. Oh my God. And, you know, just, just looking at, at, at her body in that condition in at that odd angle, you know, it just, when you see it, your head just says, she's not supposed to look like that. She's not supposed to be, her body's not supposed to be in the dirt at that angle. Mm. And, and, and there's nothing you can do about oh, that. Oh my God. Dog. Um, you know those those images stick stick with you. Sure, they do. Um, but but I think uh, you know there's there's a been there was a lot of grass grassroots efforts back then. And I remember a hundred black men, you know, taking to the streets. I, I, I and and I and I really thought this is what it's going to take. You can't we can't police our way out of this. We need the men in the community to step in and talk to the young men and say, don't do this. You guys got to stop. Whatever your beef is, it has to end because we're all getting caught in the crossfire and, and, and we're not hurting any, anyone else other than our own people. And, and you know, it's, un, it's unfortunate, but I'm still out there in South Los Angeles and Compton on a regular basis. I, I work for a government contractor doing investigations. 
uh, for low income housing. And, uh, you know, what I see on a daily basis is uh, the biggest threat to young black men out there is not the police. It's not the sheriff's department. It's not racism. It's not uh, white people. Tell it, it's not white supremacists. It's the. It's, it's not the Republicans. Mm-hmm. It's not Donald Trump. It's other black males. Yeah. And they're killing each other. And, and it's all over narcotics trade activity. And that's the tragedy. You know, if Black Lives Mattered really did matter, they would be spending all of that money that they have, and they have millions now. Ninety million, uh, hundred million in those in those very black communities to help those people out, because uh, you know the people who are living there and are not involved in gangs and narcotics, which is the majority of people who live in South Los Angeles, they're just the working poor. Mm-hmm. They're the uh, underemployed or unemployed or uh, immigrants to this country who don't speak the language or are undocumented. Uh, they're the ones who are, who are caught in the crossfire. They're the ones who are being victimized by the predators that live in that community. It's not outsiders. It's the people within those own communities. It's terrorism. Uh, who A brain, lot of people are on their, terrorized. Preying on their own community. Yeah. And it's, it's a sad thing to see, man. I'll just tell you that. It's a yeah. sad thing to see. It sucks, dude. I, I want to ask you, you know, before we wrap it up, you know, because I always like to end my show with some sort of message. But, um, you know, you got guys out there who say, man, that's my homie. That's my homie for life. He'll never snitch on me. If some shit go down, we going down together. We doing this time together, blah, blah, blah. We ride or die, blah, blah, blah. Based on your history, if you could put a percentage on it, <laughs> how many crimes are solved because someone snitched on their homie? Uh, you know, uh, I'm going to say about 97%. God damn. But that's I'm my homie, just, Gil. That's my homie, dog. Come I on. I know. I know. <laughs> you know, when, when you hear people, I would take it to the grave. We'll take it to the grave. Look, let me put you see, in the box yeah, and tell you numbers. how much time you're facing. Mm. You know, they put you in the box and tell you how much time you're facing. Uh, yeah, people start talking real quick. <laughs> And then when you start using the tactics of, you know, well, I, I got your homeboy down the, down the hallway there, and uh, he says you did it. I don't know. You know, if you want to go down, hey, that's up to you. You want to tell me something? I'm here. You don't want to tell me? Okay, fine. I'll walk out. You go ahead and do your thing, bro. And, you know, the, and you, you, uh, you, know, you, you tell them some stuff, and, uh, you know, pretty soon they're going, hey, wait a second. I ain't going down by myself. <laughs> you know, that, that take it to the grave nonsense, uh, that's a big talk when you're smoking weed and drinking beer. Uh, But when the rubber meets the road and you're looking at spending your lifetime with other predators behind bars, that's a whole different thing to to face. Mm. There it is, straight from the horse's mouth. The Gil Contreras program, I encourage you guys to give it a listen. And uh, Gil, is there anything else that you want to promote uh, while you're here? The floor is yours. No, man. I just uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It's, yeah. it's interesting to you know to have the tables turned on me. And generally, I'm asking the questions, uh, but it's uh, it's a lot of fun to to have have these kind of discussions. And and I think it's important because there's a lot of misinformation out there. And I think the media is mostly misinforming the public. And I think it's a I think it's a shame. And that's one of the things that I hope to do with the platforms that I'm on. Uh, is to, uh, you know, to bring more clarity, especially to uh, public safety related stuff. Uh, I, I think that's an issue that everybody cares about. Um, and, I, and I think people want, I think they want honest answers. And I think if you give them honest answers, they can handle the truth. They can handle and they go, oh, okay, all right, well, I thought this, but I was wrong. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's what I hope to do. You know, my stuff is all there at GilContreras.radio.com. Uh, uh, I'm on all the platforms, uh, wherever you get your podcast. Uh, if you just put in Gil Contreras, it'll pop up. Um, but I appreciate the time and I appreciate the, uh, interview.